Okay, I slightly changed the title, even though we're going to be talking about the same things. So I like the play of words from the end of David's days to David in the end of days. And we're going to be, the main part of the talk will be dealing with the end of David's life, because the Book of Kings gives us a very interesting message and interpretation into who David was in the end of days and the importance of what happens after him. So we're going to start at the end. So we're going to begin our talk with David passing and then backtrack a bit to get a better understanding and then see how who David was influences the whole perception of who the the, the future king of Israel, the future Messiah, again, term Messiahs, as we talked before, somebody who is anointed, so who the anointed one will be. So let's get started. Yeah. Why aren't we moving forward? There we go. Okay, so David's last day. In First Kings chapter 2, we're told, so David slept with his fathers, which is an interesting term using for somebody who died. We'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. And was buried in the city of David. And the days that David reigned over Israel was 40 years, seven years he reigned in Hebron, and 33 years he reigned in Jerusalem. And that's it. David dies. There's no ceremonies. There's nothing. Right away, then sat Solomon upon the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. Well, what's missing from the story? When a king passes, there's major mourning. There are huge ceremonies. There's a burial procession. His family are present. There's a tomb that was built for him. No, we go right on Solomon. No mentioning of anything. David dies, it's over. He doesn't have it. There's no procession. There's no people mourning. Nothing happens. It's over. The great king of Israel who reigned for 40 years, one verse, and we'll understand why. And not only that, even the story itself is wrong, which we'll get to in a second. The book of Chronicles, which was written some 600 years after David, feels the need to intervene and make it look a little bit better. So we're told, thus David, the son of Jesse, reigned over all Israel. And the time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years, seven years he reigned in Hebron, 33 years he reigned in Jerusalem. Same story that we're told. And he died, and now we already know, in a good old age, full of days, riches and honor, and Solomon his son reigned in his stead. Now the acts of King David, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the book that we have. And in the book of Nathan, the prophet, a book we do not have. And again, many, many books are mentioned in the Bible that most likely did exist. We have the book of the wars of God. We have many books. And in the book of God, the seer. So there we have two books which have not survived. But despite that, if you don't want to get the additional reading, you could, with all his reign and his might and the times that went over him and over Israel and over the kingdoms of the countries. So we have a nice little story, but Chronicles was written 600 years later. Josephus, we're talking a thousand years later, in the Book of Antiquities tells us this, when David had given these to his son about the public affairs and about his friends and about those whom he knew to deserve punishment, he died having lived 70 years. So here we're already told how old he was, and then we have seven years and six months he reigned in Hebron over the tribe of Judah and 33 years in Jerusalem over all the country. He was buried, so now we know who buried him, by his son Solomon in Jerusalem with great magnificence and with all other funeral pomp, which kings used to be buried with. Moreover, he had great and immense wealth buried with him and the vastness of which may easily be conjectured at, by, by what I shall now say for a thousand and three hundred years afterwards. Okay, so now it's already, we have later interpretations or later stories, which might be a tradition passed on, but the bottom line is the, <laughs> the news reports, the book of Samuel, nothing really happened. 
So let's just get some understanding. So for 40 years, the estimate is probably 1034 to 994, but 40 is a typological number. So was he really in power for 40 years? Solomon reigned for the same number of years. So it's already a bit suspicious, but was it 40 years? Was it 39 years or 40 years? Because the first book of Kings tells us, and the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And then we're told that Solomon slept with his father and was buried in the city of David. His father and Rehavam, his son, reigned in his stead. So we have a similar thing, but with Solomon's passing. Here's an interesting statue of David, which was donated by Italy and is located directly across from what is today considered David's tomb and also the room of the Last Supper. Now, his reigning 70 years. Now, where did, where did Josephus come up with that? We'll see in a second. In the second book of Samuels, the long before David died, we're already told David was 30 years old when he began to reign and reigned for 40 years. So again, in retrospective, we're told in the book of Samuel how long David reigned for. And here we have slightly different numbers. In Hebron, he reigned seven years and six months, so which Josephus told in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all of Judah. Interestingly enough, in the book of Psalms, which is credited to King David, we're told, the days of our years are three score. So three score, in other words, 60 years and 10. And if by reason of strength, they be four score. So yet it is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly oh, yeah. away. So the way and, David um, is, yes. Oh, so that is, so we have David already foreseeing that is content with his 70 years, and then it comes to an end. Now, we're told that David lay down with his father, slept with his, with his fathers. In the Bible, there are two terms that are used. One is to lay down with your, with your forefathers. In other words, you, you sleep with your fathers, lay down, and you're collected into your people. Now, here we're going to see a short, very interesting film, which will give us an interesting idea of what that actually meant, those terms that were used. Hello. Okay, so he's speaking in Hebrews. Now, in 1979, this excavation, which took place right below the Scottish hospice, an amazing burial cave was found. And you'll see what, it, what the physicality, now here you can see little headrests, almost like pillows. Because when somebody was died, they would sleep with their forefathers. They'd be laid down with their forefathers. This is an area where they would be laid down, they would sleep for a year until all the flesh was, <laughs> was, came off and then they'd be taken and put into the family cave. In other words, so they were collected to their people or collected to their family. They were put into the central area. Now, the interesting thing is this cave, most of these caves were looted, just like we were told that David and <laughs> and it was buried with a lot of riches, usually they were looted by cave. Now, what, what saved this cave was there was an earthquake and the ceiling collapsed on it and buried the bones and the riches that these people were buried with. Now, this is the burial cave from the seventh century BC. 95 bodies were found here. We have one that was still laying down when this collapse, and these are just some of the findings that these people were buried with. It was a phenomenal pottery, jewelry, rings. And the most interesting thing that was found, there was two little amulets that took years to open, and on them they found the priestly blessing, may the Lord bless and protect you, which is the earliest biblical verse found anywhere, because that's from the 6th century BCE, it can be seen in the Israel Museum. But this is, so when they said David slept with his fathers to lay down with his fathers, there's a big problem. Why? Here we're told, now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered it now, before, well, before we get to that, what is the problem 
with David sleeping with his father. That's not the case. He didn't. If he would have, he would have had to have been buried in Bethlehem, but he was not buried in Bethlehem. He was buried in Jerusalem. So the person writing the text of David's life, his death, didn't even feel it important enough to get the facts right. David did not sleep with his forefathers. He slept in a new tomb that he built for himself or had or was built for him. So even nothing, they cover nothing of the ceremonies. They even get the facts right, wrong. So now let's go back to the last, to the, towards the end of King David's life. Now King David was old and stricken in years and they covered with him with clothes, but he got no heat. He's an old king, and first and foremost, he's old. All his power and wealth cannot defeat age. And we're told, wherefore his servant said unto him, let there be brought for my lord uh, the king a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, and that, thy, that my lord the king may get heat. Now, Notice who's not here. He's all by himself with the servants. All of his 30, 18 wives, none of them were there. All of his children, he's all by himself. And the text makes a very clear point about that. There's nobody there for him. He's an old, almost abandoned. He's cold, not just physically, but also psychologically. And that's quite clear. And the chapter is almost making fun of David. Maybe it is actually making fun of David because David, the great womanizer, needs his aides to find him a woman. None of his wives are there. The man who, who, who women almost threw themselves at him needs his aides to find somebody. And the gun appearing in the first act, the would have told, where's for his servant said unto him, let there be sought for my Lord, the King, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let him lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get heat. Now, if we look back into the story, we have the story of the prophet Nathan, when King David, in a way, stole Bathsheba and sent her husband to go die, he tells the famous proverb, and he says, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, of course, talking about Bacheva, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did not eat of his own meat and drank of his own, of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him, to him as a daughter. So we have the play on the words bringing back Nathan and Bacheva, which of course will appear very soon. So already at the very beginning, we're told what's going to be happening very soon. So who's speaking? Nathan. To whom? To King David. And about who? About Bathsheba or Bacheva. What's David's response? David says nothing. What does that mean? Is David passive? Does he still have his facilities? It's a good question, and the text wants us to ask this. And then we're told, so they sought a fair damsel throughout all the coast of Israel and found Avishag a Shunammite and brought her to the king. Now, where did we come across Shunammites before? Well, let's read one more verse, and then we'll come across them. The damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered him, but the king knew her not. In other words, there was no sexual relation with Bacheva. That's very, that's, again, will come to play a part later on in the story. And here's another Shunammite woman. We go to second book of Kings and we're told, and it fell on the day that Elisha passed in Shunem, Shunammite woman from the village of Shunem, where was a great woman and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was, and and as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And then we have the whole story of him having a child, and the, 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 the widowed woman and her child who dies, and Elisha brings him back to life. And then, of course, we have a parallel story in the New Testament. First, let's take a look. This is in the town of Shunem, where Shunem is today. It's now an Arab village. 
there is a monument where traditionally the Shunammite's house was. And you can see there are huge pilgrimages. You can see what it looked like in the beginning of what it looks like today. But the huge pilgrimage is there of people requesting to have a child, people who are barren. And if you look at the map here, here we can see Shunammite, and here we can see Nain, or Nain, or Nain, which is, of course, the story where Jesus with the, with the widow and her child, and Jesus resurrects her child. It's not coincidental that the two of them happened, again, an hour walk, but in reality, they're four kilometers, not even through maybe two and 2.6 kilometers apart in an aerial view right next to each other. And if we look over here, you can see both of them. So those of you, when you come to Israel, if you go to the church, if you wind up and go to the Church of Transfiguration, you can clearly see the two of them from this area. So that just to give a little element of the Shunammite woman. Now, David, many of his troubles and issues, besides his sons not being there, started much longer. Let's go over them quickly because they will be playing a major part very soon. Amnon, David's firstborn rapes his sister Tamar and is killed by her brother Absalom. David responds to the rape in 2 Samuel chapter 13, but when King David heard of these things, he was very wroth. Doesn't say much, but he was upset. Now, in reality, we now know that the text had been censored. Now, if you look in the King James Version, you'll have, that's the translation, but we know that in the Septuagint, the whole verse was preserved. And the whole verse was, and King David heard of all these things and was very angry, but he did not grieve the spirit of a son of Nun because he loved him and for he was his firstborn. Now that's what happened when he heard of the rape of Tamar. David did nothing. In reality, David did nothing to any of his sons. David was a, a, a warrior, a strong man, as much as a father and <laughs> keeping his kids in place, he did very little. This was, of course, censored from the text because David, as we will see, will play a major part in the future. Then Absalom, who was next in line, revolts against his father and dies doing it also. Then Adoniah, the son of Chagit, this is verse 5 of the first chapter of 1 Kings, and we're told, then Adoniah, the son of Chagit, now just one thing, the meaning of the word Adoniah, Avshalom means the father of peace, of Adonia, Adoni is my Lord, Yah is God. So my Lord is God. The son of Chagit exalted himself saying, I will be king and he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And once again, the gun shows up and we'll see it in one second. Remember the verse and 50 men to run before him. And his father, had not displeased him at any time. Who hast thou done so? And he also was very goodly man, similar to Absalom. He was, he was a good looking man and his mother bare him after Absalom. He was next in line. So again, the passing judgment on David for really never keeping his kids. The author of King is already telling us that the end of his fate will be like Absalom. One, he tells us that he's good looking like, like Absalom. But then if we go, go back to the book of Samuel, the author of Kings is gives, giving us a very clear message. 50 men to run before him with Absalom. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared his chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. You're following in Absalom's footsteps. The text is clearly critical of David, the brave warrior, the dominant king who was weak with his children and could not control them. And in a way, maybe David had to be controlled. So here we have the young Adonia versus the old David. And what happens? And he conferred with Yoav, the son of Churia, who was David's chief of staff, and Deviatar, the priest, who was with David going all the way back to the time when he was escaping Saul, and they following Adonia helped him. So 
many of David's closest advisors are now siding with Adonia, because keep in mind, they're looking after their future. King David is old, maybe not functioning, maybe the captain is afraid, and so what's going to happen? Impression is that the king supports this, because if all of his leaders and the people that has that his chief of staff are siding with Adonia, the people will get the impression that David is supporting it. And Adonia slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the, by the stone of Zochelet. This is, we're not sure where this stone is. It's probably in the city of David. There's there are traditions that it had special blessings on it. It was on Ein Rogel. Ein, again, translations are his problem. En Rogel has no meaning. Ain is a spring. Ain Karim, where John the Baptist came from. Um, Ain Harod, the, the spring of, of Harod. So, An Ain Rogel, and called his brethren, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servant. So, all the princes come along, and they, so it looks like everything is fine with Adonia. But on the other side, we're told, one verse back, Sadok the priest, Bnaya the son of Yehoyada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shim'i and Re'i. <laughs> Interesting names, just by coincidence. Shim'i means I hear, Yishmoa, Re'i means my friend. And the mighty men which belong to David were not with Adonia. So Adonia, and probably with the advice of, of Yoav and Abiatar, handpicked the people that he wanted to be with them. Interesting enough, Nathan is returning. And then two verses later, we're told, but Nathan the prophet and Benaiah and the mighty man and Solomon, his brother, he called not. So all the king's sons, except for Solomon. Now, this is just an amazing bula. Bula is a stamp. So that's the negative of the actual stamp, which is put on a piece of plastic. This was found in the city of David. And it actually says Adonia. But it's a later Adonia, but it's a name that was popular here. The, the name Adonia, servant of God, comes back 200 years after, 300 years after the actual Adonia. So suddenly Nathan has re reappeared. And we'll talk a bit about where Nathan, where he'd come across the prophet Nathan before. We saw him when he scolded King David for taking Bathsheba. And in reality, that was the last time we encountered Nathan. Now, what are we told about the story? So the last time the prophet was mentioned was in Samuel, was 2 Samuel chapter 12. And we're told, and David, David confronted Bathsheba's wife and went mm -hmm. in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Yedidya. So if you ever have a trivia game and you're asked, what is King Solomon's middle name? It's Yedidya. Yedid, the friend of God. Yedidya. Because of the Lord. So the story tells us Solomon is the only child of David that is not called by Yadonia. And the prophet Nathan is, of course, re-mentioned. Now, it's a different Nathan. If we remember the Nathan who, 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 who scolded the king, he's no longer a fire-spewing prophet rather an experienced politician laying out a plan that if it succeeds, he is now set up for light. The people that gambled Adonia, he knows the path to David goes through a woman. And throughout the story of David, there was always that woman who played a part, who, who before or after or during the story made a major influence. Here's an interesting icon of Nathan from the Orthodox Church. And now we're told, wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, just a Bathsheba means the daughter of an oath. Sheva, like Be'er Sheva, because they took an oath, Bathsheba, the daughter, or even the bearer of an oath. Remember that, that will also come to play. The mother of Solomon saying, hast thou not heard that Adonia, the son of Chagit, doth reign and David our Lord? Interesting enough, our Lord, Adonino. <laughs> now, you hear the play in words. Adonia, Adonenu. Adonenu, our Lord. Adonia, the Lord of God. Knoweth it not. 
So Nathan is bringing Batsheva in. So he says it as it's a done fact. It's all over. But he leaves a slight opening. Now, therefore, come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel. So again, no longer the, he's not speaking the word of God as a prophet would do, but he's a political consultant. That thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son. Because as it was traditional, and we'll see after Solomon takes over, you kill off your brothers. Because that way you preserve your power. And that's what David did with the sons of Saul, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Nathan does not mention that his future also depends on the results. He doesn't really trust Bathsheba. So he tells her exactly what to do. He gives her exact instructions. Go and get thee unto King David and say unto him, didst not thou, my Lord, O King, swear? The word in Hebrew, nishbata. Same thing as Bathsheba, the daughter, she owns the oath, you gave the oath, you swore unto thine handmaid, saying, assuringly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Why then don't, why doth Adonia reign? Now, and then he continues, behold, while thou yet talkest there with the king, I will come in after thee and confirm thy words. Now, there's a slight problem because nowhere in the text is it ever mentioned that David gave that oath. David says, you would think that if such an oath would have happened when Solomon would have been born, it would have been written in the text, but it's not. There's no mentioning. So the big question is, did King, did King David swear or Nathan of Bathsheba taking advantage of what we saw was a passive old king. Bacheva takes the advice and immediately goes forward. And she says, and Bacheva went into the king, into the chamber. And the king was already, he's no longer old, he's very old. And Avishag, the Shunamit, ministered unto the king. Now, if this was a quality or not very quality soap opera, you would have a cat fight between Bacheva and Avishag. But Bacheva does couldn't care less about who the king is with. She has one issue she wants to deal with. King can be with whoever she wants. He really, she really doesn't care that much about the king, to be honest. She cares about her son. And once again, David is a tool in many ways. She takes the idea of the oath, but she takes it a step farther. Maybe Nathan was right for not fully trusting her. And she said unto him, My Lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine hand, the handmaid. So you gave me an oath, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. She gives the actual quotation of maybe a non existent oath. No hinting, no nothing. She goes straight home. She says, And now behold, Adonia reigneth. Now, most likely King David did not know that was the case. And she throws it in his face. And now my Lord, the King, thou knowest it not. Well, what are you, <laughs> old and not functioning? How can you have let this happen? Nathan was right maybe not to trust her. And he takes a very different, he can't know directly of the oath because that was something that she most likely he said to Bacheva, if it really existed, if she made it up even more so. He can say the king doesn't know, or even his entering the king's room is off bounds for him. Similar, if you remember the story, even with Esther, who could not come into the king. For Nathan, it's a problematic issue. So he takes a different thing. And then the king's assistants told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. It's very, <laughs> very similar to the story of Esther. And then Nathan said, My lord, O king, has thou said Adonia shall reign after me? 
and he shall sit upon my throne? That is, he didn't bring the news to him. He probably didn't know that the Bacheva didn't exactly follow his orders, but he's asking us a question. If you said that, that's fine with me, <laughs> King David. For he has gone down this day and has slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance and have called all the king's sons and the captains of hope and the Vyatar, the priests, and behold, they eat and drink before him and say, God save King Radun Yao. So he's bringing the news to him, but God forbid not challenging David so much because David is still king. But in reality, he's emphasizing his passiveness. But me, even me, thy servant, and Sadok the priest, and Benayah the son of Yoyada, and thy servant Solomon hath he not called. So now he's already leading into what needs to happen. Is this thing done by the Lord, the king? And thou hast shewed in unto thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my Lord, king, of my Lord, the king after him. So he's playing into what he thought. Bacheva said, and now David renews his oath. The King David answered and said, call me Bacheva, because she, of course, had been removed because she couldn't be in the same room with all these men. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, as the Lord liveth and that, that hath redeemed my soul of all distress, so once again, he's bringing God into it. And even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me. I gave an oath, and he shall sit on my throne in my stead. Even so, I will certainly do this today. So does David not know that he gave that oath? Maybe he did give the oath, and it wasn't recorded. But he's immediately playing along. And Bacheva's response is very cynical. What does Bacheva said? And Bacheva bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, let my Lord King David live forever. We have a dying king. She wishes him to live forever. She didn't really mean it, probably, but she got what she needed. The trick worked. King David, the passive who, he comes alive, he says some things, and Solomon is promised. Now here, one of the amazing things is, we, know, we can know in this case, which is one of the very rare case, exactly where Solomon was sworn in as king. The high priest Sadok, Nathan the prophet, and other officials from my court, and go and take Solomon down to the Gihon Spring in the city of David, the place where Jerusalem began, and anoint him king at that spot. We are standing here on the edge of where the waters of the Gihon Spring would have flowed during the time of Solomon, into this pool just behind me over here. And it is on this very spot where they would have anointed Solomon king and shouted the words recorded in the Bible, long live King Solomon. Now, what's amazing is that we know that because it, it says go down to the Gihon Spring. This is where you, you, this is as far down as you can go. Then it goes up a bit afterwards. And of course, those of you who have visited Israel, you've most likely gone through Hezekiah's tunnel, which was redirected the spring of the Gihon. Again, the meaning of the spring Gihon is that it spurts out. It comes out of the rock in, in spurts. And that was the major source of water. And again, anointing with the priest, with the prophet and the anointing together with the water, which was a sign of life. Later on, it was a sign of the Torah, the, 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 Jew, the Jewish law and teachings. And he was brought down to just about the spot where this person is standing. And he's sworn in. Now, in, so, so let's go back to now the days of David drew nigh. Well, just one thing because there's a problem with the, the, the picture going on ahead of time. So just an interesting little thing. He tells him to take the take down his mule and go, does that, and that is one of the signs of his becoming a king. We have a similar story with Joseph in Egypt. 
That's a sign of royalty. We have the same story with Haman and Mordechai in the book of Esther. And of course, a similar thing with Jesus when he enters triumphantly into Jerusalem. The taking down the mule into the, the is a sign, and especially since it was one of King David's mule, just like that is, we're told that, that Haman says, and take uh, a horse in that case that the king had ridden on. That's a sign of, of blessing and of royalty. Now, the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged his son, saying, Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Tria, did to me. And uh, Joab did many, many problematic acts here, just a few mentioned. And what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, and to Avner, the son of Ner, and to Amasha, the son of Yeter, whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war unto the griddle that was about his loins and his shoes that were on his feet. So he was a man of war and of death. Do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his whore head go down to the grave in peace. So suddenly we have a different David. David is coming alive. It's almost, <laughs> in a way, again, we don't know exactly what David's state was, but even people with, with sometimes have an awakening, a, a higher level of, of consciousness, and he's, David, after this happened, the, 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 his ability to influence comes to life, but show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai, the Giladite, and let them be of those to eat at thy table, for so they came to me when I fled because of Avshalom, their brother. So again, the Giladites who helped King David against Absalom, remember them. And behold, thou hast with thee Shim'i, the son of Gera, a Benjamite of Bachurim. Bachurim also means young men, but also is most likely the location, which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. Again, we're not going to go over all the geography, but Mahanaim is also mentioned with the story of, of Jacob. But he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now, therefore, he told him, not guiltless, for thou art a wise man. So he's aware of who Solomon is and knows what thou art to do unto him but his forehead bring thou down to the grave with blood. So he's already giving him orders, more or less to wipe out his opposition. And, but at the same time, one thing that David continuously did throughout his whole rule was you always have to be on the right side with God, that thy Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, if thy children take, heed in their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the thorn of Israel. So stay with God, but kill away. Now, we have, so King Solomon is sworn in, and there's the lasting lineage of David. Now, we'll understand why we're dealing with this right now. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is what we're talking about, about David is supposed to do. And then later on, it says, I will be his father, and he will be my son. Because we notice that immediately, David, the, the text made a point immediately to go from David to Solomon. Nothing intervenes. Nothing is breaking it. The importance of keeping that lineage alive is vital. And in a way that's keeping with the, 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 the commitment David had from God that I will be his father and he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. Again, rod also a sign of leadership and with stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. In other words, 
unlike Saul, my commitment to David and his lineage is forever. And thine house and thine kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So now we're starting to get the idea of why the writer of the book of Kings, in order to show there's the, the keeping of the lineage. And same thing when King Solomon died, immediately it's passed on to the next generation. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So here we have once again <laughs> the gun that showed up in the first act, with the, which was in the book of Samuel when Nathan was talking to David about his lineage. He was the one that came forward and ensured it be passed on to Solomon. In Psalms 89, we read, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. Now, just again, it's interesting. Selah is left there because it's not exactly clear the meaning of the word Selah. Is Selah some type of a prosaic ending? That's one of the explanations. The other, and again, Selah in Hebrew is a stone, but Selah here is with the letter A. It's Selah. Some of the people say it's almost like an amen. It's, 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 it's giving additional power to the sentence, and that's usually how the word Selah is used. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as faithful witness in Selah, in heaven, Selah. So here we have, we, we now have an answer why the writer of the book of Kings felt the need to jump forward so quickly. And also because you could see from his relationship to David that he did not have that much respect for David in the end of his days. And it goes straight forward to, it goes straight forward to Solomon. But now, Let's get an idea of the connection between who was David and how that reflects the future son of David or lineage of David. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute just judgment and justice in earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord of righteousness. Amos tells us, in, the, in that day, I shall raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I raise up his ruins and I will build it as in old days. We're reestablishing now. Keep in mind that most of these verses, of course, were written when the kings of Judah, when we have a split, Judah and Israel, are not exactly so I'm going to renew it in the future. Ezekiel says, I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord. I will seek that which was lost and bring it again, that which was driven away, and I will bind up that which is broken and will strengthen that which was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them. He shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. So once again, you see the end of days coming, and I will make with them the covenant of peace, and I will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land, and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and, the, and sleep in the woods. Now, there's seven points which are made, which were related to David when he was king and the future king slash Messiah. Now, because it talks all the time about the king of Israel. Again, we mentioned at the beginning, the Messiah is the anointed one. Now, nowadays, Messiah has is given additional meanings as, as that is 
but it originally the, uh, is the anointed one. The king and the high priest were anointed, so they will be the king of Israel now. One, he will be from Bethlehem. David was from Bethlehem. And Micah 5 says, now gather together in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek. But thou Bethlehem Ephrati. So Bethlehem, yeah, there are two Bethlehem. So this is, makes it very clear which one it is, the Bethlehem Ephrati. Though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth, the future king unto me that is to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That's why, again, and in the future talk, maybe we'll give a few talks leading into the whole nativity and the whole story of Christmas. Here we see why it was so important from the New Testament textual level for some of the disciples, some, some of the Gospels, to make sure that we understand that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Second thing, it's a young king. It's a young king slash Messiah, but it's usually termed as a thick king. Isaiah 9, chapter 6, we're told, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Peace of Prince. But it's a young, it's a son born, just like King David started from a youthful level, so shall he. Isaiah 11 says this, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. In other words, that, 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 that branch that grows, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And again, the wolf shall, that's why this picture is totally wrong, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. It, it, as everybody talks about lion and lamb, it's not lion and lamb, it's the wolf and the lamb. And even though there's, a, there's some wonderful jokes that come out of that, one of them is, of course, if any of you have ever visited the biblical zoo in Jerusalem, which is based on the animals mentioned in the Bible, there's some additional animals, but there's the story that there was a cage with the wolf and the lamb lying in there and people would visit and they'd always be in awe. How did they succeed doing it? And the, and the zookeeper just explained that they changed the lamb every two hours. But it's, but the concept of the end of times and the leopard shall lay down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the faultling together and a little child shall lead them. So the youngness is the one who leads the future. So we have two elements, youthfulness and, and Bethlehem. Third, the king shall be like a shepherd to his people. Micah tells us this, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker is come up before them, they have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord of the head of them. So the king leading the flock of Israel. Interesting enough, the term congregation comes from gathering the sheep together. Ezekiel puts it this way, and I will set up one shepherd over them and he shall feed them even my servant David, he shall feed them and shall be their shepherds. So the concept of, of the king being the shepherd of the people, similar to David again, who started off literally as a shepherd. And Ezekiel continues, and I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. So in most of these cases, it's literally mentioning David as the future servant or David. Now there's an argument whether it's literally David or it's somebody from the branch of David, from the branch of Yishai. The king will rule over Judah and Israel. Remember, Solomon was the last king to rule over Judah and Israel, and then the split took place. The reuniting of all the tribes of Israel is vital, just like David 
very successfully ruled over all of Israel. Jeremiah says in his day, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely, the two of them together. And this is his name where, whereby he shall be called the Lord of our righteousness. Ezekiel puts it this way. And I will make them one nation, reuniting Judah and Israel in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king of all of them. So the futuristic element, that king, that Messiah, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. He will bring peace to the world. First Kings were told about their blood shall therefore return unto the head of Joab. Remember the commandment that David said, and upon the head of his seed forever, but upon David and upon his seed and upon his house and upon his throne shall there be peace forever from the Lord. There's an eternal peace that comes with David and his family, Isaiah, for unto the, the famous verse, which is, used frequently by Christianity as a, seen as a prediction of the birth of Jesus. We'll deal with that when we deal with the nativity story. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So with him needs to come peace into the world. That's, that, that's how we know that the final king of, of the lineage of David has shown up. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end unto the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice henceforth ever for, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And Zechariah puts it beautifully, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. And in other words, more or less, we're ending, we're, we're demilitarizing everybody and he shall speak peace unto heaven and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from river even to the ends of the earth. There's universal peace that comes with this future king. He has to judge justice. He brings justice into the world, Jeremiah says. And again, these are all elements that were mentioned in many, many times with King David said in his days, peace dwell. He's talking many times talking about that, that he, he brought justice. Behold, the days cometh, says, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a, ranch, a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So the continuation of David has to bring the element of justice, Isaiah, and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and the faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Last but not least, the, this ruler is saved, redeemed by God, and brings redemption dash salvation to the world. With King David, we're told, then David put gar garrisons in Syria and Damascus, and the Syrians became servants of David and brought gifts, and the Lord preserved David with so after he went. In other words, he was redeemed, he was saved, he was preserved by God. Jeremiah, in the future, in his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. So you have this, they're saved, not, not, not saved as it's used in modern day religion, shall be safe. They're, they have the redemption and they, they have the salvation from the meaning of 
safety from few, and they shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. And last but not least, Jeremiah tells us, in those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord of righteousness. So once again, you see the element of the concept of the Lord of righteousness together with the salvation. So to conclude our talk for today, we have, on one hand, we've talked about the David and the evolution of the David with certain lines running through him. The, the seven elements that repeated themselves many times were the seven elements that then came back as the perception of what the future king, be it the offspring, be it as Matthew frequently, that is, of, of the Gospels, his own, who really continuously talks about Jesus being the son of David or the descendant. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the future. But in the, in the Jewish tradition of what this offspring of David will be, and interestingly enough, in the Jewish tradition, and it's a song that we sing every Saturday night, we talk about Elijah the prophet with the Messiah, the son of David. So that's the, so that tradition has been going through for, for over 2,000 years, the concept of the, because and why is that the case? And that's an interesting element because it has a slight connection to, I would say maybe even selective memory, because we saw the final <laughs> period of David's life, David was not much to write home about, and which was an issue that many Jewish sages had to deal with. And that's why one of the sages said, Anybody who said David ever sinned, and he clearly did, is, is a heretic. But David was not perfect. But what he did do more than anything else is he preserved the Jewish belief. He stayed loyal to God, and he kept the Jewish people for almost all the time in peace and in unity. And that is what, and from that, after the time of Solomon, or even during the time of Solomon, that ceased to exist. And afterwards, it totally disappeared. So the idea of the future David is one who brings back to the positive things that were remembered from the time of David. So with that, I will conclude.